Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Stories Out of Time and Space. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and as always, I'm joined by my, my Mad Max partner, Julian Darius. Julian, how are you doing? I'm I'm okay here in the end times. Yeah. Yes, it, it feels like the end times. We're not quite at <laughs> leather chaps and uh, gasoline-powered vehicles. Or Speak for yourself, baby. <laughs> Different parts of the world. Um, but yes, we are heading back out to the Australian wastelands, the Australian outback, for the third instalment in the Mad Max uh, saga, I suppose. They're actually officially called us with the Mad Max saga with Furiosa. Uh, for Beyond Thunderdome, 1985, the first American-funded um, entry into the into the franchise. Um. And in this, just a, a quick brief sort of over after being exiled from the most advanced town in post apocalyptic Australia, post apocalyptic Australia, a drifter travels with a group of abandoned children to re- rebel against the town's queen. It's not quite accurate, but we'll go, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, starring once again Mel Gibson as Mad Max, um, Tina Turner as Auntie Ensie, just sort of known as Auntie, Bruce Spence coming back as a completely different character, which you have to get used to. Uh, Jebediah, uh, and then beyond that, just lots of other characters that sort of has, have appeared in things. Um, so let's jump in. So, Julian, what are your initial thoughts then on Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome? Uh, I love this movie. Um, I, I think it's a lot of fun. It's got some problems that we'll discuss mm. later, but um, really, really, I think all of my objections to it are limited to the third act. Um, mm. I really love the opening right away from the opening. You have this, you know, sort of like it's bringing in the didgeridoo. It's got, you know, it's bringing in the music, you know, so you've got a Tina Turner song at the opening and a Tina Turner song over the credits. Yeah. Um, and then you have, you know, footage shot from a, a plane of, you know, the outback. And right away, you're thrown into in classic Mad Max fashion. A, you know, scene of a, an aviator with his son slamming a guy <laughs> with, that, <laughs> with a, that, uh, the, uh, like a weapon of some sort, knocking him off his camel-driven uh, thing, yeah. uh, train through the outback. And you're like, what the hell am I watching? Who are these characters? <laughs> you know, but you're just thrown into other people's stories. Uh, yeah. Right from the start, and I and I'm just totally charmed, you know, uh, almost immediately, and that sense continues, you know, essentially unbroken through two thirds of the film. Yes, I think I, I agree. I love the opening of this. Like you say, it's again, it's the fact that like more so than others, like this kind of takes on this acknowledgement of this is the post apocalypse. This is, you know, things are not easy. This is going to be a, comp- this is a very different place. Even to, um, uh, even to like Road Warrior, you know, they're like, oh, okay, this is even more so. And we'll get to sort of why in a second. But as you say, it sort of drops into a st- story and as it just gets going, it just sort of like, it's like, yep, you're going to experience this. And a camel, I love the fact it's a camel pulled um, caravan. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you think, oh, okay, you're going to follow this. And then you're introduced to Barter Town. So Mac, we find out, basically, we find out that it's Max that is on this caravan that gets pulled off. And then as he follows it, he comes to Barter Town, um, which is, again, a fantastic concept, but there is no money. Like, what is it you can barter, whether it be sort of like items or skills or whatever, to, for you know, or what is it? He meets a, a guy called sort of, I don't know, the collector, I think he's called in the, the credits. Um, he basically says to him, like, you know, 
what is your purpose here? Mm. Who do you have a beef with? Like, who are you here to see? Like, everyone goes there for a purpose. Like, you don't go to barter town without a purpose. Yeah. Um, so I love all that. You stuff have to have like something that. to barter to get in. Yes. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I do. I like all this. I like the introduction. They say it's just sort of throwing you in. You're like, what the hell is this? What's barter town? Um. And yeah, everyone sort of is still surviving in that weird post-apocalyptic, like you know, whatever clothes they can find, sort of stitched together. Um, well, and, and and let's be clear, uh, there's a line of people waiting to get into Barter Town, yeah. and uh, Max gets to the start, and there's this weird guy who is, you know, interrogating them, and there are weird people standing around in this bizarre kind yeah. of space, and you're like suddenly in a Terry Gilliam movie, you know, yeah. like, and it's weird, but it's also like brutal, and you know. Um, Everything is just strange, but feels lived in, feels real. Mm. Well, even like I say, even though it's, even though there's like a weirdness to it, and I think one of the things I'm gonna sort of, I noticed it before, and I'm gonna comment on it in this for this film before we get to Fury Road. But like, there's a you like, even like there's there's almost like in, there is a f- enforcement within Barter Town, and they have they all have a uniform, but that uniform includes like a weird red mohawk as part of a hat. <laughs> and then but their leader... I love called, this, yeah. Oh, yeah, and the, their leader is a guy called Iron Bar, who you know he's the leader because uh, on a pole sticking out the back of his, I don't know, his, his uniform, there's like a doll's head on a... Yeah, it's like a no mask or something from yeah. Japanese theatre or something. Like, yeah, it's just... Uh, that, so but that, weird. But that's like his signifier that he's in charge. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, there's although it's weird and very sort of kind of off putting and off kilter, like, there's an order to it, and you kind of recognize quite quickly that there is an order to this. Like, oh, they're the enforcement, they're wearing a uniform, it's not wholly random, mm-hmm. there is still an order to it. Um, but it's not one that's easy to recognize. Yeah, I mean, I always think that. Like there, there are times in this film where I think this is so weird, mm. but then I can kind of imagine how this developed or how this is part of a culture, mm. right? Like, and that's what I think is really fascinating: how the weirdness of the Bad Max films works. Like, it's very weird. It's very, you know, Gilliam or David Lynch at times, but that weirdness is always grounded in some kind of culture or backstory. And even if you don't know it, you can kind of imagine how this would develop. It's not totally random. And I found myself thinking about that often while watching it, thinking, why am I enjoying this weirdness? And I wouldn't necessarily enjoy this if this were like random David Lynch kind of weirdness, right? Surrealism. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Or just, you know, something, you know, Oh, here comes the part where the characters dance uh, uh, for no reason, you know, mm. uh, as they stare at each other in an ambiguous way. You know, nothing like that, you know, happens here. Here, it's, you know, I can imagine, oh, right. I mean, this is, signifies that he's a leader. You know, at some point they, you know, celebrated somebody with a mohawk and that became part of that culture. You mm. know, you can kind of imagine how and that's part of the fun of these movies. Well, if you look at the story, this was this is what I was going to say. Every one of these films is like a culmination, and I'm not saying they're a direct; they are a direct sequel, especially these three. And now I know we'll get into the sort of the the untold told story, if you will, of like what's connecting this to the other two films. But those people that are enforcement, you know, they're not wearing like chaps or anything else. But that red mohawk, that's very much like Vex from. Well, Wes, sorry, Wes from the the two. second film, yeah, from two, from Road Warrior, and there's things like that that you go like, oh, George Miller kind of likes a look, and that's sort of part of it. And I think that's there. There's a character in this we'll find later on when we get to the kids, um, that's like their shaman or their sort of like the odd one, um, that's got like the pale face and the black rings around his eyes, and I'm like, oh. That looks a lot like some of the, you know, the What's It Boys from Fury Road. Like, 
things mm-hmm. carry on. And I kind of like that. There's like almost like a tonal thing to the world that, that seems to sort of persist. Um, but you're right about this. Like, There's an order. Like You get the feel that there's an order to this. And I'm, I'm really going to get some of those themes and stuff later on when we sort of talk about how Barter Town is a representation of like 80s capitalism and it's governed by sound bites. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, before we get to that, let me just say that like, Possibly the weirdest thing is that when they exile um, Max, mm. they put him on the back of a horse mm-hmm. uh, and, and sort of send him off into the wasteland. He's facing backwards, you know, so he has no chance of steering the horse. And they put like a uh, Bob's big boy head on him or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just some bizarre, you know, um, you know, it's like the uh, Australian equivalent of like a Mickey Mouse head or mm. something and it's obviously like used it's in bad shape like but it's like the weirdest thing why have you chosen this you know and i think i have no idea what the backstory is on that um you know there's the oddity of like he's he spun the wheel and it uh and it landed on gulag but he's not being sent to a gulag he's being no. sent to his death on the you know and i'm thinking Okay, well, you know, maybe this used there used to be a gulag out there and it's disappeared. And so now the gulag thing really represents exile and death, you know. Yeah. I don't know what that helmet is from, but I like the like that's probably the weirdest thing. Yeah. But I'm still like utterly charmed by it. It looks lived in, it looks used, it looks old. And I know it's like this artifact from this earlier age that's been reappropriated which is one of the themes of this film that I love so much. Mm. No, I agree. I think that's a, yeah, it's almost, I've always sort of taken it as, and I don't, this isn't giving it a backstory at all, but mm. almost like, um, cause it's, it's a fiberglass or something, isn't it? Like, you know, okay, this is another element of torture. Cause it must be as hot as hell in that thing. Like, you know, cause you already got like a blindfold on. So that thing must be, you know, crazy how hot he is inside that. Um. So yeah, I, don't, I love it. You're right, though. It's all good. But again, there's just let, let's stick with Barter Town because again, there's some humor in this sort of thing as well. Like, you know, you can't enter Barter Town armed, so you've got to go and hand all your weaponry in. And they have a sort of a, a kind of typical joke where um, mm. Max is like, you know, the, right, you got to disarm, and he sort of pulls out his shotgun, which we all know is like the Max. Yeah, you know, that's Max's weapon, that shotgun, and then he pulls out a knife and a gun and keeps going and there's like a small pile of sort of armory there, including Wes's um wrist uh crossbow mm. is on that pile. Um and stuff like that. So yeah, I love all that kind of thing. There's kind of jokes like that. But again, it sort of makes total sense. You're like, yeah, we can't have we don't want fights kicking off in Barter Town. So you've you know, you've got to which exactly the same as, you know, elements where you see it in Westerns again. That's the thing. You can go into town, you gotta to sort of give up your weapons. Fine. And then you get into Barter Town and you just see all the other stuff going on. And Barter Town feels, again, like it has a purpose. There are people trading. His, he sees his camels. They're being traded off and all these other bits. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought this is it's all really good. Um, well, and that comedic bit is, is worth noting because I think that sort of Mad Max 1 has almost no comedy. If mm. there's any comedy at all, I can't remember. Um, two has a little, and it's sort of sneaking in as an element. Three has much more comedy, yeah. you know, and it's consistently Spielbergian. It's consistently like, you know, a, a, a face sticking through the window during the chase, you know, in an awkward way, or, you know, these, uh, a guy, you know, climbs up and then is punched in the face through the darkness. Mm. You know, it's very Indiana Jones. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, in fact, I, yeah, completely agree with that. Like, this almost has that sort of, oh, we're going to have some slapstick humor and we're going to have this, we're going to have that. Um, none of it really ever at Max's expense, other than this one time. I think, you know, mm. the, the, a lot of it, because they sort of introduce other characters then that are going to allow for um, that comedy to, to sort of, you know, to take place and to, to be a part of it. Um, 
but it's also this is the time sort of we, you know we we're actually going to find out that the plot let's say the plot of this film starts to take place so max basically to get into bartending so i've got skills i'm as you know i'm, as, I'm the, as good as they get and here's the weapons and you know so he gets taken to auntie played by tina turner and we get an 80s an 80s standard um saxophone which i kind of love the score to this film i'm gonna lie i do I, too it's, i it's love great. the saxophone yeah the saxophone is great um and we get Tina Turner. What do you think of Tina Turner's performance in this? Because she's not she's not really an actress. She didn't, you know, this it was written for her, I should mm-hmm. say. But what are your thoughts on Tina Turner in this film? I like her. I mean, mm. I, I think she's very good. Um I mean, I also think that like Madonna's underrated as an actress. Mm. Um and you you sort of have to put her in a in a role that she's she's good in. Um or suited for. I think that uh I always thought Tina Turner should have had more jobs like this. Mm-hmm. Um, she's fun, you know, in the same way that like Madonna could be in a movie and then she does a few songs for that movie. And it kind of like takes on, you know, uh, uh, is sort of of a piece. She's doing this here. This is, yeah. you know, her turn. And she, I think she's, she's very good. And also um, leads to one of my favorite Tina Turner songs, you know, we don't need another hero. Um, me too. Which yeah, I, I love that song. Sh- well, yeah. I think we both have confessed we're, we're Tina Turner fans. Oh, huge, uh, huge and, Tina and Turner fans. She's experienced yeah. the sort of renaissance in the last few years uh, mm. post her death. Um, but I was a big fan of hers from the eighties, you know. And uh, I mean, she, I loved her stuff in Miami Vice, you mm. know. And she was a, such a big part of that eighties feel that I love. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. I, you know, I never like really thought at the time, like, oh, right, this is a black woman starring in yes. an American movie, you know, this super prominent role, uh, being given the celebrity treatment, you know, which she certainly deserved. She was a queen. Oh, yeah. No, and she's a, she, she, the thing for me is in this, the most notable thing is I say, she's, she's fine as an actress. That's all, you know, she, she's not being asked to do anything too, you know, in that range, but she's got screen presence. Mm hmm. Like she's got real charisma and real presence as as auntie, and um, one thing that I learned in the trivia for this, the hair that she has in this film is a wig. Um, but her when they first tried to sort of get it all in, her hair was so big, her natural hair was so big that they ended up having to. She they told her, you know, this this may have to happen. We're going to shave. Could we? Could we shave your head? Wow. And she was she was down for it. So actually, she's wearing a wig in this, and underneath. She's got a shaved head. She's gone the full sort of Sinead O'Connor, um, keeping with the eighties. So, yeah, fair play. Look, she was committed to doing this role, and she, I think she does a she does a great job, and she's she's cool on screen. Um, and I, I think she's a, she is whenever she's on screen, whenever she's in it, she sort of adds something to the film. Um, and we will talk about the third act and stuff, but like she's sort of the end of this film, and I think like the way that she ends it. And she, you know, she refers to Max as Raggedy Man and all that sort of stuff. It's just, yeah, she's just cool in this film. Like, you know, God bless Tina Turner because she's awesome. Um, but the point is, that she gets, she introduces, we introduce to her and the sort of the politics of this, and we find out what a key factor that although she is the queen, the auntie of Barter Town, she doesn't fully rule it because beneath Barter Town is Underworld. And Underworld is where everything gets its energy from. And Underworld is ruled by Master Blaster. Uh, and <laughs> everything is powered by methane from pig manure. Which is, I, I would say, how fantastic this idea is. That they're like, um, you know, we well, no pet, g- gasoline is pretty much gone. So they're now having to rely on alternative fuel supplies. And they've now returned, to, they've got this idea of, of methane from, from pig manure. But there's this sort of, power play there's this power struggle between auntie who's like the face of barter town and master blaster who is a small person um as the brains master on top of this really huge oh. guy who's the all the all the muscle blaster um who runs underworld and you know so bizarre but i love it it's brilliant oh well i mean i think all these characters are crazy characters you know Mm. much as they sort of were in mad max 2 but you know this is a further development of that 
Um, I, I, I want to real quick back up to Tina Turner and just say uh, she had already starred in uh, The Who's Tommy, mm. uh, directed by Ken Russell, one of my favorite directors ever. Doesn't get any attention. And she is a stunning as the acid queen and mm. has so much presence. And if you have any doubt, like she should have been cast in so many roles like this. All you have to do is see these two films. Um, she, you know, steals the show. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, getting to, to Barter Town, like I love the fact that um, Mad Max arrives in the middle of other people's stories. And it's that spirit thing where like he's not he's the main character, but he's not really the focus. Mm. And everybody who he meets is in the middle of other things. Yes. And so, you know, the fact that he is dropped into this political situation that he only dimly understands and we only dimly understands is charming to me. You know, this idea of sort of like this is a lived world. And everybody is in the middle of something, right? Um, and I don't know how you write like this. I mean, this is it's it's kind of amazing to me, right? That just in so many stories, you just sort of like assume everyone is in a status quo until you know the action mm. begins. In fact, in life, everyone is in the middle of you know questioning their life and their marriage and you know changing jobs. And there is no status quo, right? No, everything's um, always changing. But we sort of imagine there is, and we project that imagination into our fiction. Um, but it's not really the way life ever works, right? Um, so I, I do sort of love how he's dropped into this story, which is really Barter Town story at mm. this point. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, this is it. He's a part of a wider story, um, and it will it will be again later on, mm-hmm. um, which I've got questions about. But we'll. we'll... We'll get to, that. but yeah, the thing is, you know, we get to see um, how Barter Town is sort of fueled. Um, I mean, later on, we'll see this power struggle between them that we find out that Master Blaster or Master in particular has a valve, and if he wants to, he can just he literally can switch off the power to Barter Town. Um, and so, what happens is, Auntie wants him taken out so she can have someone running Underworld that is under her control unloyal to her so that she's got full control of Barstown. Now you find out, you find out that she started it and there's a great line where she says like before the fall, um, I was nobody. I was a nobody. No one paid attention to me. But after that, I built this, like I built Barter town. Um, and again, I love that, that there's a backstory to this. Like she's obviously gone through some sort of, sort of struggle or whatever, but like, she has created Barter Town out of nothing, um, you know, after the, the final fall, which we'll again we'll get to. Um, but Max agrees to it, like, he's like, Yeah, for 20, you've got me for again, much like two. He's like, All right, that, that is the deal, the contract is. I, I told you I'd offer you skills in order for me to get my stuff back, so it's a contract 24 hours doing what needs to be done. Yeah, I'll off somebody. Sight yeah. unseen for to get my stuff back, sure. Yeah. Um well that's my we've said that though, like Max is not the conventional hero, is he? Like he's not there to be he's he's just trying to survive, and that's the thing he's like, I want my stuff back. And to do that, I've got to do this job. So cool, I'll do it. You know, that's the contract. I'm a, you know. And so he goes into the underworld and sort of you know, watches what goes on, um, wading in pig shit and all this other stuff, and it's um, Can I just say I love the design work here, mm. and I love the sort of um, layout of Barter Town. Like Barter Town is a relatively small settlement, but it's a scale, you know, it's an order of magnitude bigger than the settlement in two. Yeah, um, and it's obviously still ramshackle, but it's got sort of like above and below. It's got, mm. um, you know, Auntie living in this elevated section, which. I'm not sure it's the most secure way of, you know, it does allow you a sort of panopticon like way of observing everyone, but like somebody could take a torch to it pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but it's cool and sets her apart. And then there's this underworld, as you say, right? That's literally filled with shit, you know, mm. and dark. Um, 
and you know we're we're figuring out how to run stuff on methane now. Yeah, in real life. No, yeah, we're waiting for Barter Town. We're just right the corner from it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it, that's what I'm saying. That this film sort of has these things, and and so I want to I want to put this. This this is where I want to sort of start placing some of my theories on this film. So we highlight that that Auntie is a representation of what existed before the fall. So we've known that... This, so here's the story. We've known the story so far that during Mad Max, the first film, the world is sort of coming to a bit of a spot. There's been, a, there's been an issue in the Middle East. Oil is sort of like running out. We know that the world is politically and socially sort of on the decline. And Max lives on the outskirts anyway because he sort of lives outside of the big cities of Australia. So it's already sort of, you know, smaller towns that are starting to suffer, being taken over by um, gangs. Two takes place two or three years after the first film, and the, the the decline due to the lack of oil has been dramatic. And people that were looking for this to res- to pull themselves away from civilization have done so in more and more violent ways in the wastelands of Australia. Again, no real idea what's going on in the rest of the world. We know that this is happening, but we don't know, like you know, other parts of the world might be fine. It could just be Australia that's had this collapse, and everyone else is going like. Those Australians are nuts. Like, you know, we fix everything else. They've always been nuts. (laughs) Yeah, they've carried it on. Um, Everybody knows, you know, Australia is just naturally tends toward Mad Max in the wasteland, right? Like, you know, you could build the Sydney Opera House, but, you know, you're a few miles away from somebody, you know, gutting a kangaroo like uh, Luke in Return of the Jedi. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. Yeah, they're two meals away from Barter Town, is what we're sort of saying. We're not to any Australian listeners. We kind of, I've got family there. I love Australia. But the point is, I beyond do. that, beyond um, that, that collapse, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome takes place 15 years after Road Warrior. And between um, that, we've had um, a further collapse, which has resulted in some government's last minute panic, which resulted in a nuclear strike, which then escalated. And then this nuclear strike has been, that's it. Like the whole, the the world has finally collapsed. Now, whether a nuclear weapons hit Australia is, we do not know. They're aware of nuclear explosions and the fact that the the nuclear bombs dropped, but we are now living in a new post nuclear world. And it, parts of it is irradiated because as he's going into Barter Town, some guy tries to sell him water and he runs a Geiger counter over it. And the guy's like, what's a bit of radiation between friends? Um, mm-hmm. So we're now living in a, a truly post-apocalyptic world. But I love the fact that the writers of this film and George Miller, when they contributed, were like, right, yeah, we've got to kind of explain this progression that we've had. Here's the story that goes with it. And it's not an instant. We've said this, like it's not an instant thing. Um, but that past world that everyone's still sort of clinging on to, this is obviously sort of like, you know, if the timelines, they explain it as well, this is sort of 20, this is probably 18, 17 to 18 years from the events of Mac, Mad Max. Mm-hmm. To me, Auntie and Barter Town represents what came before. It's almost like we know that this version of capitalism and this ruling class and this structure work. This is what we were used to. This is what we are building. So Barter Town is just a representation of that. Like there's a ruling elite. There's the people that rule, that, you know, there's the working class that sort of live underground, that work underground, but truly actually have the mm. power, the power of production. Um, and in the middle is everybody else just trying to survive through bartering or whatever. Um, and these two sort of like, you know, Labour, conservative, whatever, however you want to put it, the ruling elite, the labour force, at, at odds with each other, um, and it's mm. that I think it's, it feels like it represents that. And uh, so, an auntie, you know, I'm not saying she's representing Maggie Thatcher, but you know, the thought crossed, <laughs> the thought crossed my mind a little bit, which is like, I want to crush the miners. I mean, the people that hold the energy source, um, and yeah, that they represent. So whilst we're in Barter Town. We are still holding on to everything that existed before 
These are all older people that all knew and existed before mm. the fall, and they're trying to cling on to that, that older world in some sort of framework. That's part of my theory. We'll get to the next part in a bit. but Yeah, I'm not sure that that would make sense without that next part, right? Because, yeah. you know, uh, we would just, you know, see it as the world, right? I mean, mm. I, I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, I I like this idea that they've carved this out of the waste. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, Barter Town is an impressive operation, and it's hard not to be on their side. Mm. You know, to the degree that the events of this film disrupt Barter Town, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Mad Max is not a good guy. I mean, nope. you know human surviving may well depend on places like barter town right um this is you know sort of like not necessarily early stage civilization as you say it's sort of mirroring you know capitalism you know if not late stage capitalism um but which is a term i hate because it presumes you know early stage capitalism to disappear yeah. right you yeah. know or like late really you know i mean it, it was never laissez-faire to begin with but you know yeah i don't it's a dumb term but um yeah no i mean i i like what you're saying um and i i certainly all of my instincts are to be on the side of barter town and on the side of you know humans creating larger collectives through organization that are able to do things that people could not do on their own mm. um that is the essence of you know society mm. yeah the auntie's created us she created a community and more than that she's in put in enforcement it's a safe ish place within the walls so you know people yeah. acknowledge it that there's, there's uh at least some sort of law enforcement that it's the political machinations that are sort of making it a bit more dangerous um so I, you are right i think you know i'll, I'll revisit it as we as we go on, so whether or not I'm on the side of Bartertown. Um but yeah, it's interesting. Like this, they've carved this out. And I think her story is great. She's like, I was nobody and I built this. And so she's trying to protect it from the people that are Master Blaster that runs the underworld. Um and so Max is sent down there to kill him off. And he so he he, he finds out though, because again, whilst he's in there, you, as we've said before about his car that they're trying to make his car work and underneath his car is a set of more dynamite than was ever in the first couple of films. Um, he has explosives under his car. And also we find out that blaster is affected by high pitched sounds. Which so just important. to be clear, this is, I mean, cause the car blew up in two, this is a totally different model yes. car, right? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just, you know, really, and it's being pulled by camels now. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. dynamo, the, the explosives is less about sort of is, is less linked with the ignition of the vehicle as it was before. It's yeah. now sort of like if you try and steal my stuff, I'll just blow. I will blow you up, kind of thing. Well, he's seen its you know efficacy. Yes, <laughs> two, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen it work, so you know um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, but it allows him to endear himself to. Master Blaster a bit to learn things because mm -hmm. he's able to find out. And again, we've got the mechanic that sort of he admits he's like, I don't know how to do this. And he sort of it's linked to this, linked to this, or it's linked to the battery. And that's where Max is like, Oh, I wouldn't do that. And he's like, Well, how do you know? Well, because I set it up. So we get all that again, and he does the thing. And he's basically sort of um scoping out underworld. And this is where we start to and then he reports back. He's like, yeah, I've I've learned enough. I know I can take them out. How do we do it? And we now learn what Thunderdome is. So, I do have a minor objection, and I I love that he's dropped into this entry. Much as I don't think that that uh, wonderful tree-like sort of perch is strategically a, a good idea necessarily. Everybody's seen him go up in this elevator twice to go yeah. talk to on You know, <laughs> yeah. like it's not a very covert plan, right? Yeah, like, it's very, it's very open plan, is what I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with what is. Yes, um, don't but... tell anybody who you're working with. Uh, could it possibly be the ruler who we've all yeah. seen you go up in an elevator <laughs> multiple times? Yeah. Um, 
But it does set up the conflict with Master because he's then set free. He's mm. done the work. He's given his sort of, he's, as he says, he's given his t- due time. He's worked in the under- underworld, which is what he gave contract for, is that as people know it. And so he can demand his stuff back. So he confronts Master Blaster to ask for his vehicle back. And they introduce, again, say Thunderdome, which is this big iron or metal structure. And this is where I love that they have um, these these sort of like these sound bites, easy to remember snippets that you can remember sort of like. So Thunderdome, two may enter, one may leave. Two um, men, yeah. Two men enter, one may leave. Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's really sort of, you know... And again, it's got me thinking about easy to digest politics and headlines and stuff like that. Like they all start chanting it. Um, and we'll get another one with the spinning wheel. Um Well, I uh, love this announcer. And he's obviously a sort of like PT Barnum kind of announcer guy. Yeah. Um, but he's great. And you know, when they start, they've got this kind of like showgirl there who I don't know why she's mm. there, but you know, um, She's not really given a name or anything, but this announcer is great. And, you know, he's got charisma and he starts off by saying, like. Times were chaotic. We all know how violence can consume people. You know, Thunderdome is an attempt to deal with that. And, you know, I'm thinking, right, this is this is the evolution of humanity. (laughs) Right. I mean, this is, you know, we we sublimate, we make these rules, we make laws to restrict, you know, it's it's uh, the Oristaya, right? It's mm. the cycle of violence that is innate to human beings that l- law uh, is able to constrain. Um, and so Thunderdome, I love that it's sort of like acknowledged. Yes, it's entertaining. Yes, it's sort of like. Echoes Rollerball and you know yeah. stuff like this, and it's great design work and, and, and stuff. Um, I love how they've turned it into sport, mm. um, but it's this kind of you know it is a sort of dual dueling system. Um, but they're very conscious of the fact that you know this is what we have as a way of constraining the natural savagery. Uh, that would otherwise reign than the yes. chaos it would cause. Well, that's, that's civilization, idea. right? Yeah. <laughs> Again, no, no. I'm on Thunder. I'm on Thunderdome's side. <laughs> but this is the point. They said this is what Auntie's done. Auntie's introduced all this. She's provided an order. Like it's simple and brutal, but it works. Like how else? We we can't have courts. Courts that are too long winded. We don't have time for that. We haven't got the. You know, we need something swift and. Um, you know, that's effective. And so you get Thunderdome, which I love. And I thought like, again, just so you know about this, you said about the announcer, um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. I love that so much. It's actually in the intro to 20th Century Geek. (laughs) (laughs) He's ace. That that whole announcer thing is fantastic. Um, Yeah, and I love that. I I think Thunderdome is great. And the fact that, you know, there are no rules. Like he says, you know, he says, don't try to break any rules. There aren't any. Um, and yeah, then they just go at it. Like you know, it's it's Max versus Blaster, and they have this. They have the fight, and Max's secret weapon is a whistle. That obviously, a high pitched noise it will distract Blaster, which will allow him to to do what he needs to do. Um, they're also on like bungee cords, which is cool. Makes some interesting things, and people yeah, can just I've throw weapons sure in randomly. It- yeah, I've never been sure that it quite makes sense, but uh, but I do love the sort of like metal spikes on the cage, and and I love the participants. Uh, one of yeah. them gets murdered during the yeah. fight yeah. In, in a very sort of rollerball slash ro- RoboCop kind of you know like Paul Verhoeven s touch, you know the the sort of random violence that is just accepted. Yeah, it's almost like you know you if you. Attending uh, Thunderdome and climbing up them, like you're taking your life on your in your hands. Like the part of the risk is watching it as well. Um, Attend at your own risk. <laughs> yes, and I love that. I mean, that's, that is that is really cool. Um, Management is not responsible for gutted patrons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it is. It works, and that you know they have the fight, and everyone's up for it. They're all sort of like they're all chanting away. Auntie has her seat that sort of glides down from the. Uh, 
the high level platform down to you know another platform on the dome so she can watch with um the collector and iron bars there and she's got her people around her um and then the fight ensues and I say the fight kind of goes off and um master is watching on you know quite hot confident that he's going to beat up max max gets the advantage after everything overall blows his whistle gets a mallet and just starts pounding on on blaster's head and he's been wearing this like big almost like juggernaut kind of style helmet mm. and and blast this helmet off of blaster and it's revealed that blaster actually is um he's a grown man but he has um down syndrome and so there's this thing of like you know, and then the fact that Master runs in then to protect him, yeah, is kind of touching. Again, you've said this thing like it's like he's like no, no, he has the mind of a child. Like he, you know, he doesn't know because it's been kind of brutal, and you sort of seen him like he's been stamping on Max, he's been throwing him around, like he's he's been playing to the crowd a bit. But like you do kind of realize that he's just playing to the, you know, he's playing it up. He doesn't, I don't think he, oh, I'm not, I don't want to guess. That sounds awful. Like, you know, but they are playing it. Like he doesn't know the severity of what he's doing. He's just sort of playing a part and he's enjoying it because he's getting the attention. Um, Well, he's obviously killed people before, right? I mean, he's, yes. he's quite comfortable killing. But, but I don't think it's sort of like, he's, it's not like he does it for pleasure like he's not taking pure joy out of the killing he gets the joy out of people chanting for him because it's sort of you know that sort of thing rather than you know i think it's more a case if he knows if he does if he wins he gets chanted rather than the joy of the kill i'm sort of uh confused by why max sees him and then turns to auntie and says this isn't part of the deal it's like you know you're willing to kill a man sight unseen. Yeah. You know, this guy is a killer, right? He has tried to kill you. Why do you suddenly develop a conscience here? I think I mean, it's, I know what it's supposed to be, right? Yeah, but... yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's from Max's point of view, I think he sees it, like, especially with, with Master running in to protect him. Mm. I think he realizes that he's like, he's just a, he's just a tool. Like, this isn't a fair fight. Like, you know, this wasn't me fighting someone with, with who's, you know, this has been a setup. And it's not a great setup because you're right, because Black Master was more than happy to put him in there with the expectation he would like twist Max's head off and, and you know, whatever. So you, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, to me, it still works when like Max has still got that, there's still that glimmer of, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, as, they, as they said in the, um, the second film, he's an honourable man. Like he honours his contract, but like this is where he's like, "Well, this wasn't quite the deal." I don't know. Like it's, I know you. It's difficult to. It's difficult That's kind to of what bothers me, though. Yeah. Right? It's like you know, I, I, and I'll go with it, right? I mean, I'm not offended by it, but uh, I, I do think, you know, he, he's honoured his contracts. You've mm-hmm. agreed to kill a person sight unseen. The guy's wearing a helmet. I mean, if you pull off the helmet and he's horribly disfigured and you feel sorry for him. You still agreed to kill him, right? You have to kill him, and he's tried to kill you. I mean, kill him. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you you are right. He has got. We've established I'm a bad human. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are right. I think that's the thing. It's sort of um, it's 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 because he's shown to uh, you know when they focus in on his face, you know, it's recognizable that he you know he has Down syndrome. You know, in the eighties, this is sort of like they're trying to be shorthand. This is shorthand to say, um, you're supposed to sort of feel sorry for him. You know, because they say he's like a child. Like he's not. It's not a fair fight. Um, you know, I can feel that that's supposed to be sort of the the justification for it. Um, but it leads to the next thing again, where like you know they drag him off and. If Thunderdome's not enough, he's broken the law, so now he's got to face Auntie's judgment, and they have the wheel. Um, and they so have. A... Let's establish the the system of law here, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are the rules exactly in Barter Town, right? Number one is if you're not allowed to kill anyone, right? If men fight, they have to go into Thunderdome, and only one can leave, right? Somebody's got to die. Yeah. Number two is really the only other law we're aware of is if you break a deal, any deal, 
you have to go to this metal wheel and it's yeah. fun and you face your fate. And they explicitly say, you know, like, look, justice is random. We all know justice is random. <laughs> uh, so, you know, justice is bullshit. So let's just acknowledge it with the, the wheel. Um, yeah. Let fate decide, which I, I do find quite charming. And I like the idea of sort of like, um, which I which I, I don't think is that bad of sort of like the contract is everything, right? Mm -hmm. Your word is your bond. It's well, that's sort what of an extension got. of two, right? Yeah, of, exactly. That's it. That's all, that's all you've got is you, mm -hmm. your word. That's all you can trust. I agree. Yeah. And especially in, you know, a sort of primitive capitalism, you know, barter town, right? Like you, you promise to deliver these goods as part of the deal. Yeah, that's punishable conceivably by death. Um, you know, but fate aside. So I, yeah. I do quite like that idea. Yes. Um, I just want to sort of highlight, because they have it, was it, is it uh, break the deal, face the wheel? Mm. Mm -hmm. is, is this is the tagline <laughs> for the wheel. So again, another, this idea of law by soundbite, you know. There have been people in million. my life where yeah. I wish this deal, this wheel would have existed. <laughs> Um, can we just go through this off? So I've got here uh, the outcomes of the wheel are mm -hmm. acquittal, amputation, auntie's choice, death, forfeit goods, gulag, hard labor, life imprisonment, spin again, underworld. So those are the options that are on the uh, the wheel as it spins around. And as you said, Max ends up with gulag, which is sort of exile from barter town and into the wastes um with the silly head on mm -hmm. um yeah so this is it this is where he does get sent out and you know auntie makes a bit of a show of it people are all watching him go off and they have a horse that has a bottle a glass of water on a stick attached to the front of it this is one of the things i find i i questioned because the horse is still an asset so yeah. not, they're not just killing off Max. You see the horse mm -hmm. die. They go out into the desert and the horse collapses from exhaustion and dies. But that's a waste of an asset. It's a big asset, right? It's a big that asset. That asset might be more valuable than a human, depending. Yeah. So that was the only thing that I felt was a bit of a... I was a bit like, oh, you know, yeah. that kind of feels like a, an odd... Um... Well, same thing with the water, right? I mean, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. But how many of these how, how many of these helmets do you have lying around that you you, loads. you want up everything? <laughs> yeah. like, they found an old carnival ride and just yeah. like, oh, <laughs> those are stifling to wear. We'll use those as torture devices. What, Bring all twenty of them back. That's it. The, what what the part of uh, underworld that you don't see is actually the manufacturing of these heads <laughs> in a far corner. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned about the horse because it's clear that. Ki one of the people who is sort of sentenced to the underworld uh, to labor has been sentenced for killing a pig. Yes. And partially it's because the pig's not his, but it's also because the pig is there to produce methane. The pig is not there for pork. No. So, you know, that animal is more important than that human, right? Mm. <laughs> so that only makes your point about the horse stronger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, you know, they, they are... They can either be a beast of burden, they can be a form of transport, they could be all kinds of things. So, yeah, I don't know, it does, it feels like, yeah. And I, I, I just want to say, I do kind of love, again, this sort of, um, the morality of this place, because we find out that he did it out of desperation to feed his family, killed this pig. And his family's been, we know, he, do, he doesn't know what's happened to his family, but he's having to face sort of the underworld, life imprisonment in working in the underworld. And, um, he's like, well, down here, that's like two or three years. What's yeah. that, really? Like, you know, that's me done. So he's kind of sort it's of a accepted little dark. it. It is. Yeah, <laughs> he, he sort of accepted it. Um, but anyway, but Max being sent out into the into the waste is kind of where this film takes um, a turn mm -hmm. into a different film. Now... I did want to highlight again in sort of the, my, I didn't go too deep but in the research. This was a spec script. This was not originally written as a Mad Max film. Interesting. And it started more focused on what we have in the second half 
And it wasn't until George Miller came along and was like, oh, well, if we had Max and we could do this, this and this. And so things were taken out and the first part of the film with Bartertown was added in. So that was all an addition to an, a, a spec script. But Max collapses in the desert uh, and is found and taken to this kind of, I don't know, like a sheltered oasis. It's got water. It's sort yeah. of in the rocks. It's, you know. Um, there's, a little, there's a stream or a yeah. small river. Yeah. And um, they find that there is this collection of children and, and, and young adults um, that live in this little alcove. And they cut, they cut you know, Max's hair and tied him up a bit. Um and yeah, he he sort of they believe he is this legendary character, Captain Walker. Um and then they tell this, you know, they basically wakes up and they tell him the story. This is where we get all the information about the atomic explosions. But once the bombs dropped, and this is another thing that's fascinating. This is like a, this was an escape attempt. Yeah. A pilot called Captain Walker got as many people as he could, families and stuff, onto a jumbo jet and took off. Yeah, where was he going? I mean, obviously they don't know. The, no, yeah, these that's kids, a, they're but never explained. It, it's also so I don't really understand that. It's also weird that he took the adults but left the kids. Like you think? You well, know. No, 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 he took them on the plane. The plane crashed because the plane yeah. crashed and they all survived. Yes, but they left the kids to go find help, didn't they? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Um, in this oasis, and um, never came back. And never came <laughs> and their back. Names are inscribed on the wall. Yeah. Um, they were sort of left in charge by the older of the kids that have now you know, Savannah Nix and um, I, I never get the, the 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 name of the lad. Um, but yeah, there's this sort of um, they've sort of formed this um small. I would say Lord of the Flies, but it's not because it's there is no Lord of the Flies kind of like community. This is a very well sort of almost organized community. They've got hunters, they're going out and hunting, they're using the water, so they're, they're sort of surviving and mm -hmm. if not thriving. Um, weirdly, one of them's pregnant. You notice in the background, I'm like, all right, cool, all right, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to dig too much into that, but um, they have this story, and I there's two elements. This is one of the things I like about. What how Miller presents things. They've clearly had a memory of television, at least the older yes. ones do. Yes. And so they've they've constructed a frame and they tell it by standing behind this frame and they they call it the tell. This is you know this is what they call this device. It's oh yeah I will pass on the tell and they pass it between themselves to 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 talk. And this thought, is so so brilliant and painfully <laughs> beautiful. Um, yeah, and you can imagine how you know in in um, <laughs> in, in less civilized countries than mine, how uh, they call it the telly. Mm -hmm. um, That's what we call it. Yeah, <laughs> T telly. Oh, oh, I, I, I wasn't. I, I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 I'm less civilized. <laughs> no, you're, I'm not, being, you're not wholly I, wrong. <laughs> no, I'm being I'm being sarcastic. Um, you know, sometimes I call it the telly. But, uh, you know, the telly sounds a lot like the tell, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so you can imagine how, you know, language has evolved in this place. And, you know, this movie has been criticized by some as sort of like playing on the Peter Pan trope of the sort of lost boys. And mm -hmm. for some people, that doesn't work. For me, I love the idea of the cargo coat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people aren't aware, but I mean, we know and have observed in real time how um, islands in the Pacific that were involved in World War II where, you know, U.S. soldiers with land on the island to this day um, have landing strips mm -hmm. and build, you know, um, wooden models of uh, of planes and of uh, radios and stuff to call down those planes to deliver goods because mm. that's what they used to do and this is and, and, and in one of them they revere a u.s soldier right um you know as a god as a deity and this of course reveals so much about the human brain and how it invents religion yeah how it processes reality uh, post hoc ergo prompter hoc, 
right? Like I prayed for rain and then the rain came. Better make that guy a shaman, you know, mm-hmm. because whatever he did worked and we're going to keep doing it for generations. Like yeah. this is the way the human brain works and it's flabbergasting, but horrifying and fascinating. And so but, but that's what you're seeing here. Watching the cargo say. cult here. Yeah, exactly. And, this is exactly and it. it all kind of makes sense. Like they have the the record. One of my favorite moments is there's a guy who has um a a board of uh circuitry attached to his chest. Yeah. He obviously doesn't know what it does or what it did, but they use the radio to try to communicate with uh Max while he's unconscious. And they'll say, like, does anyone, you know, read me over? And they'll go through the motions as if this is part of, like, they don't know what this meant. Well, you know, the, the original context is lost, but it's this special way of communicating. I well, love they, this they, shit. I mean, this they, is they call it, What do they call it? They call it outer words, don't they? He's not using his outer words. Maybe he's using his inner words. And they're like, well, we can't access those. So like yeah, they 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 don't you say they try to describe they have them sort of fixed as sort of certain. Yeah, I agree. I love I love this. It's sort of these thoughts and the way that they they have these 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 remnants of this technology or these ideas or these you know these these abstract sort of you know um, concepts, but they don't really know what they are. So they're trying to give them a practical purpose, but it, it means nothing. Much like the tell, but they've used it now as a sort of a communication tool to sort of like, and they meet every night and they tell the story. They have to, they they realize, especially Savannah, she goes on about how this is now an oral tradition. Like we have to keep saying this till we remember it, like it's becoming law. But we also recognize that it's changing because, well, they don't have all the information, yeah. you know. So they tell this story about the bombs falling, and the plane taking off, but they don't call it the right things. The words are changing. The t- the telling of the story is changing. And then it's this thing of like, well, we crashed and the, these, you know, clearly the adults left, looked after the, we're not, you know, it's clearly like, look, we're going to go out. We're going to do a scouting mission. We're not going to be more than 24 hours. And then they clearly died in the quicksand or in the desert, yeah. right? This is clearly like, that's, you know, that's what's happened. And then they've just been abandoned. And then, but the the leader of this thing was the captain, the pilot of the ship, Captain Walker. And they've now got this hat, which they've added a bird to because this thing of flying. But they don't understand their, you know, the way airplanes work. So they actually have Max tied up <laughs> upside down, mm. and they're like, "It's going to fly. Show us how to fly, Max. Like how you know, Captain Walker, show <laughs> us. let him go." And he just falls in this water, and they're just like, "Oh, well, that's kind of disappointing." But what I find interesting about this point is as they tell the story and they've had these, this event with Max, you talk about the religion, right? This is what is the interesting thing. This is, this is all of a sudden a divide mm. because there's mm-hmm. one side that's like, no, 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 you, you, you've been too harsh. You've been too, you're judging too quick. This is definitely Captain Walker. He's going to save us. And then you have Savannah and the others going like, no, he's come out of the wastes. It sort of tells me that there is the, you know, this is all nonsense. We're waiting around for something that's never going to happen. We need well, to strike said, out. Own. I'm not Captain Walker, yeah, and this is she, never going to happen, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like, like, she's listening and saying, well, we've got to strike out on our own then and mm. go out and find something. Um, and I love that, that, that there is now this divide, because she's the one that's been doing the tell, as it were. She's the one that's telling the tale, And so she's very quick to be like, right, well, it's wrong. Or at least we've got to start being a bit more proactive. So as you said, look, there's a cargo cult, but splits in belief systems or whatever sort of forming in that it's it's you know um very well done oh you know? i agree uh you know you have the development of heresy you know? mm. um yeah and i find also this idea of the oral tradition fascinating because i'm gonna get into trouble here um but you know there is a huge debate about how reliable oral traditions are Mm. and you know look our countries went around the world and found a lot of people who did not have written language and we transcribed their languages and record and uh, then people followed and recorded their myths and their stories and then there's you know fast forward 50 years there's a big debate about like well were the that just were those stories just things that somebody made up because they were being paid by a white guy to tell them a story? Right? Yeah. Or, and they've been inscribed today 
like today, the ancestors of the person who tell that story revere that as part of the original culture that's been lost. But it may just have been somebody telling a story to get money and food from a white guy. Well, it's, you know? it, maybe not even that. I mean, the, you know, the, there's reason I, I recently listened to a, a podcast called Ghost Story, which starts as sort of like you know, an invest, someone sort of trying to look into this potential ghost that that was in a, a, a childhood home. And he enters into this sort of like family history about um, this family that really reveres this great grandfather who was linked with all these things and made tales about how he actually wrote these songs and he was a surgeon and all this other stuff. And then was involved in this, this dramatic murder event in this house. And he's like the only survivor. And then as he digs, digs into it, you sort of find out that the murder is like this one thing, but actually a lot of what he talked about is kind of embellished or quite dramatically embellished. And this family yeah. in this podcast starts to have to sort of face up to this fact that, that for generations they've been revering this guy, talking about the achievements that he made, and he didn't make half of them. And as you say, it's the same thing, isn't it? This idea of like, you know, it's sometimes not just because it's sort of like, oh, I'm doing food. Sometimes do it just because out of pride or out of like just a desire to embellish things of, you know, oh, we saw this and this happened. And yeah, of course, this is how we do things. Like, it's, well, it and, sticks. And there, are, and there are people who say that these oral stories were passed down verbatim and did not change over centuries, right? <laughs> yeah. um, which I don't buy. No. I mean, you know, and, and there there have been studies that say that might have been more or less possible, but I, I, I'm very suspicious of this, you know. Um, and, you know, you get into these weird situations right where you know like you're saying i mean with a with the family history um you know people will say well these are sacred stories they wouldn't just change them the way you know a, a white family would about their ancestor but um but everything we know about people suggests no things change right mm -hmm. you can't tell the same story the same way twice it's not something that happens and um so you have in real life these these weird situations where, I mean, okay, I live in Hawaii. Hawaii had no written language until white people transcribed the Hawaiian language. Mm. There are debates about, like, it is, you know, to my mind, it is basically impossible to reconstruct what that culture was like prior to white arrival. And yeah. we know that culture changed Topsy turvy, oh, you know, within like 30 years, it's just totally different. Uh, fascinating how much that mm. changed, but also how do you reconstruct culture that didn't have written language? Well, you have th these oral traditions, but how do you know that they haven't changed? How do you know that these reports of oral traditions haven't changed? I mean, I just find the oral tradition and its role in a culture's memory, which obviously that is the, the that is the norm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, having writing in human history is a weird thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, we understood the world much like these kids for the majority of all of human history. And yeah. so I find this just deep and fascinating and really interesting. And the fact that it's thrown in there in this post apocalyptic, you know, Mad Max action adventure is, you know, fascinating and gets at takes the apocalyptic genre or the post-apocalyptic genre and, and turns it into something that starts to get at humanity mm. and not just our savagery without laws, right? Hence Thunderdome, but also how we understand ourselves and how we understand our past. Well, that's, yeah, and that's it. This is the thing I want to get to. Cause it, all this stuff, we sort of, again, you know, I said about those ideas that sort of flow through and grow through the Mad Max films. This is all alluded to with the feral child um, in in Mad Max Red Warrior. Like you know, it's here. We find out at the end of the film, it's him that has been narrating this story. Now we witness the story, but we don't, and we don't know how he has narrated it to the tribes in the north, which is we find out what they are, you know, later on. But this thing with Savannah, sort of like you know, when she is regaling the story of the fall of the the world and this jet this this jumbo jet experience like she is simply doing what the feral child will have been doing 
with those tribes in you know and in, in, in later generations um the one problem i have with this is i think it's at this point where she's sort of telling it is this is a reveal so we've had the hat we've had the thing the tale's all been told da 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 they pull back there's a big painting of max yeah and I'm like, that's you think not it's even too close. It's right? too it's, it's close. Walker. It's too close for you. It's like, oh, yeah. this is Captain Walker. I'm going. No, that's Mel Gibson. Like it's got the same hair <laughs> and it's got the same coat on. Like it's too close to be, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's too close to not be Max. If that, do you know what I mean? And that's yeah. Now, if that was new, if it was like wet, and they were like, oh, we've drawn this because we've now seen you. And you have now, if it was made clear that like, oh, we now recognize that you're the missing part of the story. So we've added you to the wall. But I don't think that's the case. That seems to have been there. I don't know if this is like a reveal, like an unveiling of like, we've now added you to our story pictures. Oh, God, that's interesting, right? Like maybe that that was added after he was found. That's what I'm saying. Like I've never I've, you know, cool. watched it this time. I was like, I don't know if it was always there. Or is this like they're telling the story and now they are revealing that now he's arrived, they have added, because it looks very fresh compared to some of the other paintings. That would so, be fascinating. And and it would also seem cynical, but actually be pretty in tune with a lot of how religion has worked, right? Mm. Now we know prophecies get written after they're fulfilled, right? Yes. Um, you know, there there is an account I, I, I found... Uh, you know, recently uh, during the Crusades of, uh, you know, a, a guy going into the rubble of a building and, you know, clearly pulling a spear out of his baggage and then reaching <laughs> down into the rubble and holding it up and saying, ah, the spear of destiny, you know, that pierced Christ's side and everybody laughing at it, you know, who was there. And yet within a few years, it's being reported as a miracle that everybody dropped yeah. to their knees, you know, in veneration. You know, utterly laughable at the time, but yeah, who's to say well, what really happened, right? Well, this is so the story that I, I couldn't a, you put no, that this, on the wall. Well, exactly. Yeah, and that's what it's I'm a saying. Great point. And I, so I, I like that as again as another point. You talk about that. The one of the one my favorite versions of this is the Angels of Mont uh, from from World War One. There's a story of a bunch of World War a series of British World War One soldiers being saved. By joining, you know, whilst they're fighting artillery, all of a sudden these angelic entities appeared and fought alongside them, and, and sort of like fought back the Germans. Blah blah blah. Right, and people were reporting it. Going, I've heard, I've heard it from the trenches. This is what's happened. Da, da. It was reported in the news. And if you go back, and I, I've, you know, I've now read about this, and I've sort of looked at it. You go back and you find out that this wasn't a true account. It's actually um, one of my favourite sort of weird writers, Arthur Macken wrote a book called The Bowman about the Bowman of Agincourt appearing and helping some British soldiers fighting in the trenches. But he writes it in such a way, and it was appearing in a newspaper as a story that some were like, I've seen reports of supernatural beings appearing in the trenches to help the soldiers. It then gets translated, and all of a sudden, you get it in actual uh, like ghost story books and things going well there, there was this weird event in world war one that no one can explain you can it's because it never happened it was a fictional story that's now become law and that's what it is isn't it like you say it's something completely different that just becomes the truth to some people um, and i do think that's what's happened um in in this case which is great i think that's fascinating to me that they are building their own law um but you know, and also there's this thing, there's a staff. Like one of them's got like this staff that um has got something sticking at the top, and it's you know, maybe they've used it for hunting. And Savannah after a while then decides after this debate has happened, so has agreed, um, we're going. That's it. Her and several others are gonna leave. Um and Max has gone like, No, <coughs> out there is the wastelands, and beyond the wastelands is Barter Town. You are not ready, you are not fit to go there. You will just it'll you know, eat you up and spit you out. <laughs> but they try to leave anyway. And he recognizes what this spear thing is, is a rifle. And they've had like the bullets have been hanging there as like decoration. Mm-hmm. And Max is able to grab them, load up, and starts firing this gun. Fair play to Savannah. So she holds her ground and like to carry on. Like she's pretty badass. 
Well, and they also throw spears back at Max. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Land pretty close to him. Yeah, which is a great scene. But he has this um this line, um it, which is basically sort of like he it's a bit like him leaning into he's thinking if I lean into this prophecy, I can sort of help, I can almost protect mm. them from going there. He says, um he says, I ain't Captain Walker. I'm the guy who carries Mr. Dead in his pocket. Like I've, you know, like I can't die. So, but you know, so I'm not your Captain Walker. I'm something worse. <laughs> trying to put like the fear into them a bit. Um, and I like that as well, where he's going to sort of like manipulate the law a little bit as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, he is going back to my theory about sort of uh, the connection with the, uh, uh, Fistful of dollars, you know. Mm. At one point, he's literally called the man, man with his name. <laughs> yeah, in this. yeah. Uh, and yeah, I do sort of see the the uh, him claiming like I'm the guy who's got death in his pocket. You know, ideal death. Yeah, uh, you know, it's sort of right up uh, the same line of character. Yeah. So I'm loving all this, and this is that thing that this is the other part of that theory. You know, I've said about. And you've sort of kind of covered it. We've talked about how Barter Town is that re- is that sort of thing of it's dirty, it's powered by pig shit, it's you know, it's sort of like it's relying on sort of this form of capitalism. And then you have these kids that have this sort of idealistic view of this this prophecy. They they have this sort of hope and this you know this way for the future, and one is going to sort of outdo the other. You know, can, can you survive as being this? You, you know, you say savage, but could you survive as this more pri- let's just say primitive, more primitive society that relies on sort of oral tradition, is community based, like they're recognizing they've got to rely on each other over Barter Town, um, and that seems to be the conflict of like they are the future. You know, which is sort of like it's almost also the song. You know, um, the children are our future. Yeah. So you see it as kind of a conflict uh, between the two. I mean, at least not, of the two paradigms. Yes, not direct. I mean, this isn't like a war, but like, you know, there's this choice of, you know, Barter Town exists. It's a sort of a holdover almost from the old ways. But there's potential. Is there future in mm-hmm. this, the way that, you know, of, of this new way of living? Could we go back to a more simple sort of way of life that actually is probably is more conducive to survival in the way in, in a post apocalyptic you can adapt, you can, you know, we can, we, we need to be more basic. I don't know. Yeah. And I could imagine, you know, sort of 30 years hence, more and more people have come to that oasis and they say, you know, right. Well, you want to join us in the oasis, you know, join, you can, but you're going to have to worship our gods and, you know, you're mm. going to have to, Pay allegiance to Captain Walker, um, and uh, thirty years later, they've got a bit of an army, and yeah. they're flexing their muscle, and you know now they're, you know, the Etruscans force, or something, you know, yeah, a force to reckon with, you know. So yeah. I don't know. It's 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 you know, advancement will happen, but is it a new beginning? Is this, is they representing this new generation, these new children, their new beginning potential for humanity? Um, Max doesn't want that. Max is like, stick around, stay here. That you know, he goes with them. He sees the plane that that crashed. He says, "I can't make that fly. It's literally buried in sand." That's a goner, and that's what I think. Savannah sort of kicks back and says, "Right, well, I'm off." Um, and eventually, he follows into this. He sort of they go, and he's sort of shown, and he goes out into the wastes to save them. Um, and he finds them trapped in the waste in the sort of the quicksand. They lose one of the kids in the quicksand. It's quite brutal. I it mean, is. When, when Max arrives, he he's running because the kid is slipping underneath the sand. By the time Max gets there, the next kid is already underneath the sand, and they're able to save him, but not the tiniest one, which mm-hmm. is at the end, he's dead. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah, he's gone. Like, he's just a bit of like material, isn't it, that they were holding on to. Yeah. He's just so. Yeah, like this film's kind of brutal at times. People, could, what's funny is it was a PG thirteen compared to. The, the previous two, it was, it was like, you know, a lesser rating or lower rating. But mm. yes, there's less sort of out and out violence or even sort of, you know, suggestion of sort of sexual assault. But 
this still has dark moments. This has got I would actually say this is kind of darker in time in places than some of the others. Yeah, I mean so I had forgotten this is the first Mad Max film without a gangway. Right? Yes. So you know, <laughs> times have changed, right? Yes. I'm not sure you could get away with that. Um but also, yeah, I think so much of it is the blood mm. that you know you can you can murder people. I mean, we see a guy, you know, the you know, Blaster is killed with a crossbow. He's killed anyway, despite Master's intervention. Yeah. Um, you know, Max's brave stand there means absolutely nothing. Um, but, you know, so this is pretty brutal. Mm. But, um, you know, it's uh, there's no blood, right? There isn't the splashing blood of Mad Max 2 or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's it's less sort of in your face, I think. Um, th- this is the part I sort of need to clarify. So they save the kids from the uh, the, the quicksand, and they see because they've had this thing. Is it called like Tomorrowland or Neverland or what? They've got this idea of this. Yeah, Tomorrow Morrowland or something. Tomorrow Morrowland, what they you. call yeah the cities. Yeah. Um, and they see these lights on the horizon, and they're like, "Is that Tomorrow Morrowland?" And he's like, "No, that's Barter Town." <laughs> but it's our only so like potential for survival and i'm like wh- right. why i don't you know you had all this water what why is it your I think, survival is it too i f- wondered that too i think yeah. they've just run out of water right yeah. uh okay so it is precisely at this moment that i feel that this this film starts to go off the rails literally and figurative yes i agree well it's trying to sort of like this way it's trying to sort of like it's clearly two films, that <laughs> two scripts are trying to converge to create a climax. Yeah. yeah. Um, and both of the first two bits, so like if we break this into three sections, just because, you know, not really the first act, second act, but like Barter Town, um, Captain Walker, Oasis. I'm liking both of those bits yes. individually. And I agree, as this comes to the climax, it gets messy. Right. Um, well, starting with the f- the first thing they do is sneak into Barter Town. Yeah, it's not really clear how. Th- I mean, they go through a pipe, right? Which kind of echoes that kid sneaking in and out in in Mad Max Two. Yeah, you know, I'm fine with the pipe. You know, uh, I'm fine with all of this. But suddenly, some of them, like, have got to through the bars and are sneaking into that underworld. And at one point, they slide down a chute. They've yep. just been deployed to drop grain to the pigs. I don't know how they got up there. I don't know what that's connected to. There's a lot of just kind of like, nah, doesn't really matter at this at the infiltration. You know, you uh, said about you said about Spielbergium. Yeah. This bit feels Spielberg. This made me think yeah. that the the bit with the 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 shoot that's basically like a slide. That's like very Goonies. This is very. Yes, 80s centric. This felt that I agree with that. That's where I was feeling it in this scene where I'm like, you know, having a uh, master be in, he's been sort of dipped in with the pigs and all this other stuff. Like, I'm watching this, and again, I'm thinking, this feels not so much studio mandated, but like they're going for something. They, 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 I can imagine that there are notes coming from the studio to George Miller going, This is a studio film. <laughs> yeah, I don't want, you know. The, the master survived. He wasn't eaten by pigs. I don't want anything too gross. You know, we want just, <laughs> this is what's happened. Um, so yeah, the studio notes are like, no, you can throw someone in a vat of shit yes. and have a close up on him and make, and make it as chunky as you want, mm. but you can't show blood. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, it does feel sort of, this is where I do sort of feel it softer. And the plan I'm not entirely sure what the plan is. Uh, is it to get water and to leave? I, d- I don't really know what the plan is. But this is where the other, the, the other, you know, says Spielberg, the other, um, the other film that came to mind at this point, uh, where the kids go off and start doing their own thing and swing down, hook. Yeah. This That's... very much made me feel like think of Hook when all of a sudden they're like they're swinging down and fighting. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this feels you know that brutality and edge that was there even in this film before. 
has yeah. been replaced by something a little different. Um, yeah, that's not wrong. I mean, I did feel the Goonies vibe. Hmm. Um, but I do feel that, you know, like, we don't know the plan. We're not really entirely sure how they really got in. You yeah. know, the slapstick elements, you know, take over a little bit. They're a little stronger here. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, the logic kind of starts if going out the door, especially in a movie that is pretty focused on, you know, telling a coherent story with a lot of background. Um, it seems to not really care about certain things all of a sudden. Yes. Things that were sort of not so much it loses stuff that's been set up, but it kind of loses track of um, what it was doing before in the way it was doing it to go right now. We need the big action climax and we need to justify it for different things. Um, well, and so they escape the underground on a vehicle that goes on train tracks. Mm -hmm. Where the fuck were these train tracks, man? I don't know. Like, I like the idea that this was originally built on an outpost, you know, that maybe was along train tracks or something. Like a mine okay, I or can something. get along with that. Yeah. Sure, you know. Um, a tiny little town, you know, a few structures, you know, grew into this. Okay, fine. Mm. How do those tracks run from the underground to the above world? And how are those tracks still intact for miles? You know, how did you not notice these before? I mean, I that's certainly the weakest point of the film for me. Yes. Yeah. I li I like the fact that well it's one of those weird it's one of those oddities all in all because it's not a train either. It's a truck. It's a lorry that has been converted to railway track wheels. Mm-hmm. Um, but then has a motor on the back of it. Its engine has been retrofitted to act as to work on methane, but then acts as part of the mechanism that then pushes the uh, and it basically generates the energy for for Barter Town. So the reason this all goes pear shaped is because J basically it's a big generator that was used for Barter Town, and they're stealing it. Um, but I'm not entirely how sure get how on the tracks. I don't I mean, know. You know. Yeah, this is yeah. this is yeah. But what? Well, yeah. what? You know, I like that. I I wish there were more about. I, I I wish I did not get that. That is what's generating all of the power mm. for Barter Town. Yeah, that, that's how I took it. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but they do. They go off in it, and you know, <laughs> they've they've now been spotted by Auntie, and she's going to send people after them, and we get the obligatory Mad Max chase. Right. Which well, I we. Uh, oh, go on, no. Well, I will say that, you know, Auntie's speech about, like, we will rebuild because, you know, this machine has been stolen, there's been explosions, you know, the methane and whatever, and there is chaos mm. in Barter Town. And Auntie takes charge. Mm. And she says, you know, we will, it's this kind of like George Bush on the rubble of the World Trade Center kind of moment where she's like, look, I'm still in charge, and we will fucking rebuild this. In the meantime, Let's get some guys together and let's go after them. But I do love that speech, that there is at least an attention in this climax to this society and to the barter town as a civilization that we've seen in the first. Oh, yeah. I mean, it shows how fragile. But I think this goes to my point before that what they're trying to this highlights is how actually fragile barter town is. Like it's incredible what they've achieved and how they've built it to run on methane and they've got all this stuff there, lights running, a bar, all this other stuff, right? They've got this emulation of what it was like before the fall. But it's still but the moment that this thing falls apart, as you said, there is chaos. They are not prepared in the same way that this sort of more primitive bunch of kids are to survive in the wilds. And that's kind of it. That that to me is is again is interesting. Um, but you're right. The chase is on, and it's all now. It's sort of like you know, people in in leather and 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 mohawks jumping all over this truck, and there's sort of there's not as many stunts. They clearly mm -hmm. don't. You know, the stunts are lesser. It's it's filmed in a nicer way. Yeah. Um, and there's some the humor. There's one moment again. I was actually it made me think of Lone Ranger with um um. Johnny Depp and, and, and Army Hammer, when Iron Bar gets trapped on that thing as it swings out and he has to pull himself up uh, to go over the bars and all that sort of stuff, and then he gets knocked off and the kids 
cutting it off. I was like, hey, that's all kind of funny. Um, but one of the things that sort of, there's a moment in this whole sequence, it's all going on, and then we cut to inside the truck, and two of the kids have found a record player. Mm. And you said about them trying to emulate what they do, and they're trying to communicate with it, like he's twiddling the the, the knobs on his um, the circuit board on, his, on he's got over his chest. And Max reaches in and just puts the needle on um, the record, on yeah. the record, and the record starts playing. And it's basically it's a French t- <laughs> uh, tutorial, and it's basically going through these things. And the the last thing it says, it sort of says like "hello," and they go "hello, <laughs> bonjour." Bonjour, and the kids are sort of like repeating it. But the last thing it says is, "We are going home," mm-hmm. and the kids sort of go, "We are going home," and it's kind of like you know, oh, that's interesting. I like that. It's kind of a sort of an interesting mode of them sort of interacting with the technology. Um, yeah, it kind of gets back. I do love that bit too. It, it gets mm-hmm. back to the cargo cult thing, and I and I like how that record goes from um, random. Right, like mm. it, at first, the fact that it's French lessons signifies it. This was meaningless, right? This is just a. This is the most meaningless record yeah. you could have preserved, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, but then you think, oh wait, maybe this will kind of cement some English for them, right? Like maybe this will have an important linguistic mm. element uh, for them, and then it turns into this message about we're going home and you think oh yeah that's smart writing that's like you know we can say almost anything right it's just a it's just a french language thing the next line could be anything that could be taken out of context and have deeper resonance and that's just a classic writing move Uh, yeah so i'm quite impressed with that too yeah no i like all that um and then yeah and then the, the chase sort of continues the chase is where we, where I was sort of say, we were saying how brutal and insane and impressive the chase is in mm. in Road Warrior. This just feels like a lot of cars yeah. driving through the desert being shot in different ways. <laughs> but there's people jumping onto the truck and stuff, but it never feels as as I don't know tense and as impressive as it yeah. did before. That is very true. And I think the design of the vehicles is even more impressive. Mm-hmm. I think the cinematography is more impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you you see people jumping from one vehicle to the next, to the next, and then the camera kind of, you know, cuts, and but it's a kind of semi-hidden cut and kind of, you know, spins out as, you know, the vehicle, he jumps again and the vehicle takes off and you're like, oh, this is all very impressive. But they're not actually fighting in any of that. And yes. Mad Max 2 is like, you know, just brutal fighting, you know, much more chaotic. Um, it's is oddly more impressive, although I think the design work and, and cinematography is better here. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's the it sort of um it looks better, but it's less impressive. I think that's the it's that way to put it. Uh, but they, the the thing they come to the end of the tracks. And this is so stupid. I mean so, you know, the train tracks have been perfectly preserved, mm-hmm. and yet there's a kid standing on a pile of rubble, which he has not put there. I mean, there's a perfect pile of rubber rubble. How the hell are these train tracks perfect until they hit a giant rock pile? Where did those rocks come from? I mean... It's not like they've, they've, they've dug them from the desert, haven't they, to cover the tracks and stuff. But it, Maybe. This, but th- th- this know, is where... I like the kid standing there, right? And what he says, it's a Spielbergian moment as he's like, you know, you're dead meat. And then he's like, I think we're all dead meat. Yeah. And runs away. Like, okay, that's Indiana Jones, you know. Yes. But, yeah, I mean, it's just the pristine track terminating in this pile that nobody knows about. But it, it's kind of interesting that why this work, this bit works. Um, because they've also had this thing of, like, you know, um, they've got nowhere to escape. You know, so they're on the run. And so they then um, they come across Jeb- Jedediah, yeah, Jedediah. Played this is by Bruce Spence, who we knew as the we knew as the gyro pilot in the last film. This is not the same character. I know it's sort of said, it, but George Miller has basically said it was somebody else was cast in this role right up until the last minute, and then they were 
don't know if they dropped out or whatever, but and Bruce Spence was sort of quickly brought in because he knew George and was just like, could you do it? Like, yeah, all right, paying gig, I'll do it. Um, but he has this plane, so it's just it's just unfortunate he's also playing a pilot again. Yes, um, and also unfortunate that the dialogue um, calls attention to him mm-hmm. in a way that is very strange. So there are a lot of moments in this script where characters say, sort of arrive um, and sort of say hi and run away or, you know, it, awkward meetings is a kind of like recurring slapstick. Thing yes. Here. And so there's a kid, the kid who's got a gun and is planning on robbing them all and mm-hmm. then runs away and says, we're all dead meat. Apparently that's like his dad. They live in the subterranean, you know, actually pretty nice area. I like the apparently way that, they have to themselves. Yeah, and I like the fact that the the entrance is a wrecked car and it's the the boot of a car. <laughs> That's quite I like that that it's all hidden as well. So the entrance is hidden beneath this sort of wrecked car, which is cool. Yeah, I love that, um, mm. and I, and I love this. You know, on the other side, it's perfectly visible from yeah. the rocks and everything. So you know, doesn't work so well if people approach from the south, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I I don't know. They seem very comfy mm-hmm. for post apocalyptic uh, people, but um, the the father doesn't run away, and so Max comes along and says, "You, you know." And there's this awkward beating, as if he kind of recognizes the guy. Well, he does. He does recognize him. So that we should highlight that what he's recognized is two things, because obviously you know when in, we we you know. Someone scared, knocked him off his caravan at the beginning. This is them. We saw that this was this ah, pilot and yeah. his son were the ones who knocked him off his caravan. And he obviously saw his his camels being sold in um, in Barter Town, and he saw Jedediah in Barter Town. And that's where there's a scene where you see Jedediah hiding out. And after he goes up to see um, Auntie, he does a bit of a he, he scarpers. So they've obviously captured this caravan, but sold it off in Barter Town, and be like, "Right, we better do one. Like, get out of here as quick as possible because the guy's here." So that's how he recognizes him because he's like, "You, you're the one that you owe me. You lost me my transport." That makes a lot of sense. I think yeah. it's my face blindness. You know? Yeah, and um, then that connects the ending to the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. In a similar way to the second film, though, where the gyro pilot sort of costs Max his vehicle and stuff. Um, but yeah, this is this sort of comes to the final bit where they all jump on his small plane, um, and try to fly away, and it's too heavy, and so on and so forth. It's all very cliched, and you know they cut the parts yeah. off. It's still too heavy. Then the runway is not long enough, and so Max sacrifices himself. By jumping in the vehicle so that they can all fly away. Now I don't know if he thinks he can get back in the vi- in the in the plane or not, or is he accepting that he has to sacrifice himself for them to take off? He seems to accept that he he's going to sacrifice himself because uh, yeah. he wants them to take off. I think I don't think that he thinks he can jump back on the plane or something. Right. Uh, but he okay. First of all, you've got plenty of room. You know, you know, you look at how Max supposedly clears more runway for them. Mm. It's about another thirty feet. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that yeah. impact clears. Yes. If you had just started moving the plane like ten seconds sooner, you would have had another thirty feet. I mean, this is so stupid. Um, it's really, really dumb. Uh, so I mean, this not having enough runway kind of bit is really dumb. Yeah. I know what you mean. It is. It's a. It's a bit. But but it's to it's to formulate the sacrifice to get the ending that they wanted. Because right. again, they're looking to emulate the ending of Road Warrior, where they do take off and they fly. And you've even got Master. Isn't is they've rescued Master. He's now in the 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 plane. So he's waving and the kids are waving, and it ends with them sort of flying off and thingy. And you sort of get two sort of end points at this point because then Auntie turns up. And you think, oh, Max is done for. But she's a bit, she's like, ah, no, you're in the desert on your own. We've now got our vehicle back because it's not been destroyed. It's just been left on the track. So we can take the, we can take the generator back and I can rebuild Barter Town. 
So your punishment is the exile that we put you in in the first place. Yeah. And so she's like, you know, because she says to him sort of like, you know, well, look at this raggedy man. And then leaves him. <laughs> and she leaves him to die in the desert. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, and he is again left, as we've seen him before, <laughs> beaten and left to sort of for dead in the desert. Great shot. Mm. Yeah. You know, of him in the desert. And, you know, uh, yeah, it's a little convenient that she lets him live, but I'll buy it. I, I, I quite like it. And Tina Turner can pull it off. You know, oh, she looks um, ace at the end of this when oh. she's sort of like, you know, look at us, raggedy man. And then she's sort of like, she's going to drive away. It's, it's, she's great. <clears throat> um, and then we get the other um, ending, the Daniel Wire, if you will. They find Sydney <laughs> and looks great. Mm. I mean, you know, you see the, you know, the bridge, the famous bridge, the sort of like, you know. The opera you house. Only see the, yeah, and, mm. and, you know, you only see the little bit of it, you know, and the, the city looks great. I mean, I'm not sure it, how they did this, but it, it looks really fantastic. I'm kind of assuming it must be miniatures in some way. Um, but one of the things that this is the question I have. So they fly to Sydney. I don't know how far they've flown, so I don't know what yeah. the flight distance was. Do they go back and get the rest of the kids? <laughs> yeah, they do not. So I, I have two points to make about this. So number one is, Auntie has left and gone back to... The, so what's to stop them from just turning around and, and landing and picking up Max? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, they literally leave Max to die in the desert. They're like, thank you, you saved us. We'll remember you. Yeah. We'll, we'll tell stories about you on the telly, you know. Um, uh, bye. They could totally just turn around and land and pick him yeah. up, you know. Uh, so, you know, this that's a little weird. And the second yeah. thing is, yeah. So there is, uh, you know, we've talked about how I, I sort of want more side stories. And I feel like every, every character is sort of like a side story that I kind of want to see, you know, mm. like I want to see like the, the Annie Max, uh, Mad yes. Max. Oh, uh, I love thing. that. The Annie Max. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yes. Um, and so this kind of has three. One is uh, Barter Town, right? Being you rebuilt. Know, you could show the origins or being rebuilt. I'd love to see Barter Town, you know, 30 years later. Um, number two is these the kids in Sydney, you know, uh, that we see kind of flash forward at the end, following up, you know, on them. Mm. Um, and then there's the kids left in the oasis <laughs> yeah. because they have totally been left in the oasis. You're supposed to believe this is a happy ending, but in fact, all Max has done is rescue those kids who went off on their own. And there are still kids left in the oasis continuing their cargo coat. So f fully enough, like the the, ir the irony of it is, he completed the philosophy. The philosophy he pro yeah. pro he completed the prophecy for the ones that did not believe in him. Yes, that's right. And and the ones who did believe in him, which there should be some shot or something to remind you. Yeah. Right. They are going. The irony is they're going to believe that Max. And those kids all died in the desert, just like yeah. that last batch of adults. <laughs> yeah. They're even more rooted to that spot now. They're like, no, we are here. Because oh, yeah. it does show, it does show like one follow up, doesn't it? Because you then get Savannah, which I suppose is supposed to be years later, because she's older. The group has grown. There are, there are babies there now and all this other stuff. Um, and she's telling the tale, as she says, about this story about Max and how. You know, we now light the lights in some of the towers to welcome other wanderers from the desert or from the wastes. And if ever Max is to join them, like he's always welcome. And I thought that's great. I love that as an ending. Yeah, I do too. I think the, the last sort of lines are a bit ambiguous for me, mm -hmm. but you know, those shots from Max alone in the desert to you know Sydney and all of this are just impressive as hell. And I love that you sort of see them in this uh, ruined sort of skyscraper, um, unlike uh, Mad Max 2, where you kind of have to guess at yeah, you just at the audio. Are. Here, you actually see them, and you jump forward two years later. She's a man as older. All of this is great stuff. Mm. Uh, and deeply moving in a, in a weird way. 
No, it is. It was kind of like hope. It's kind of hopeful. Like you know, they've made a home, and and you know, they've made. I would suggest the the more basic, but they're clearly surviving and thriving. So, you know, they have formed a different way of life in the ruins of the old world, whilst Barter Town has created the old world in the ruins of the wasteland. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I love the fact you do get these two dichotomies. I would have kind of liked to have been maybe a, to me, as you said, like a, a, a nice little touch would have been Savannah's words. Maybe it had faded to be like, you know, we welcome those from the wastelands, especially about, and then it faded too, and you see the lights of Barter Town in the desert. You're like, yeah, you don't welcome everyone from the desert, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's places you don't go. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's great. I think this film is, we'll come to an end on that sort of, you know, because it's the end. Max is left to wander the desert, uh, but this was film was a flop. This film did not do as expected. Um, didn't do great. Um, Sad. Yeah, and it, it kind of killed the franchise for for many many years. George Miller went off and made films about pigs and penguins. Um, as one does. As one does. Yeah, uh, you know his his rebound franchises were basically sort of like kids' films. Fair play to him. Um, but. That's not the end of Max. We will be back. Um, but let's just let's before we end on that. What, any final thoughts though for Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome? You know, I've often thought watching this whether this was better or worse than Mad Max Two. Mm. Um, clearly, those two are exceptionally better than the first one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that two is a more coherent story. There are some just structural, objective ways in which two is better. It's a tighter film. It is. Right. It's less confused. It has less of those plot problems of the mm-hmm. third act that, that really are a big issue here. But I kind of like three better. Um, and partly it's the music. Partly that it's got it's got this other component to it. But also it's that it gets into these questions of civilization. Mm-hmm. that we rarely get into in post-apocalyptic movies. I mean, essentially, um, Mad Max 2 is doing the traditional uh, post-apocalyptic setting is an excuse to have people behaving badly and mm. doing crazy things, right? Um, okay, that's fine. You know, it's it, it's a setup for an action adventure. Mad Max 3 is doing something different, you know? and I, And I have so much admiration for it trying to probe sort of um, how we understand ourselves, our mythology, how civilization works, uh, how, you know, uh, law and capitalism develops, um, you know, these big questions, including at the end, you know, how we, how we remember ourselves, um, you know, how we go on. And these, these real questions about, uh, human society and using the post-apocalyptic thing to question all of that and it's light it's still an action adventure movie in some Mm. ways it's a lighter action adventure movie than two but it's starting again 18 years after the first one it's starting to get at what for me are really deep questions about humanity and i feel that by the end of the film um you know i i feel something in my heart uh, about uh, humans going on and remembering the dead and struggling to make sense of human nature, yeah, how we perceive the world, our limited ability of perception, you know. And so, you know, I really like that this is that rare post apocalyptic movie that's reaching further mm. and daring to do that at the same time that it's given you Tina Turner, right? yeah, <laughs> in a in a chainmail dress. Riding a massive wagon, um, yeah, I think you know. Looking back on the franchise so far, let's call them the the Gibson trilogy. Like you know, this is the Mel Gibson sort of Mad Max, the original OG uh, Mad Max trilogy. One of the things I like that we talk, we've talked often about what happens next. The fun in a lot of these films, what actually happens after the film? How is this tied it up? Like, how does this impact people? What happens? How do people change? And this sort of deals with that, like, you know. I think the whole sort of trilogy, and I think Beyond Thunderdome, 
I think the, the 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 name in itself is like beyond Thunderdome. Like, what is happening beyond the Thunderdome? Like, the focus is the Thunderdome, but there's a there's a ton of stuff going on beyond that as well. But this trilogy has sort of followed this thing of like, even though the budgets have increased and <clears throat> the ideas have got like zanier, it actually tells quite an interesting story about the collapse of society in an Australian outback, in an Australian waste. It's really interesting how sort of the first one. And I agree. I think they sort of, you know, the first one is a low budget. It's trying to do what it's doing, but I still think there's some good in there. And the second one grows on that. But the fact that they sort of went back and were like, oh, no, this isn't just a post-apocalypse. This isn't just a bombs went off and there was a big war. This is, oh, no, there's a whole story. Like there was an oil shortage, which created, <clears throat> you know, um, the slow collapse of government and control. The police have disappeared. We've got this one force. The courts are still in action, but we can't do anything with them. <clears throat> and Mark, Max going off at the end is sort of like, yeah, it's him going off on a revenge thing. Oh, no, there's the rest of the world collapses too. And gasoline becomes sort of a real precious commodity and all this other stuff, like leading into two. And eventually we get the nuclear war. But there's like, the fact that all of this is, there's like levels to this film. We're constantly saying, there's the world, there's the global story that we have got no real visibility of. We keep getting glimpses of this global collapse and eventual conflict. We don't really know nothing about it. But then in addition to that, we follow Max, but everything else is always said. He's ne it's never his, he's never the protagonist in the sense of like, he's following the story. It's like, this is, the second one was the story of, um, the humongous and this outpost, this thing with the, with the with the thing, Max just happens to come across it by accident, and the same for the third film. Um, you know, if it makes me think about like the man with no name or Yojimbo, those one the, the the man with no name stories. Max is just a continuation of that man with no name, you know, idea where fate takes them to a thing where they are intervening in somebody else's story but they are just a character, a part of that story and they just propel it along. Um, and I love that. I just think the more I think about it, the more I'm like, yeah. And I think that will continue with Fury Road. That that's sort of the point. But to me, this is a really nicely enclosed trilogy of films. And I do think like, you know, the fact they grow bigger in scope and idea and, and budget sort of like works. It's a real shame. They didn't go beyond this. I'd like to have seen more, um, uh, yeah, I just I just think there is something so it, the ending of this film is messed. It's a bit it's a muddled. The the chase isn't as exciting or as thrilling. It feels controlled, where Road Warrior feels out <laughs> of control. Um yeah. but it looks great and I think it does sort of pay off in a number of the ways. And you say you get Tina Turner just being fantastic. And and I also think Mel Gibson, this is probably one of his best performances so far in the trilogy, where he feels more confident and he's doing different things. And you can see that he can do comedy a bit more. Like he's open to sort of being a bit more, that charisma sort of shines through more where I'm saying like, oh, I can see why you got Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon and everything else. Um, but I, I love this. I think it's a, it's a great trilogy. I think it's an underrated trilogy. And I think Beyond Thunderdome is is uh, unfairly maligned against Road Warrior. No, I agree. And I, I, I think if you look at other big franchises, right? Say, you know, Alien, Terminator, uh, Predator. Mm -hmm. None of those can point to, like, the first set of films, whether you want to say three or four in the case of Alien or whatever, you, however you want to do it, two in the case of Predator, and say they are this strong. Yes. As those first three Mad Max. Like, you know, one is the weak link, but it's not bad. It's a solid kind of like prequel to you know yeah. the other two, and they have that progression. And I just think there the quality is amazing here, um, you know, especially compared to other franchises. Yes, no, I agree. Um, but it does kill off the franchise, and for years, you know, there was talk of other, there was talk of Mad Max coming back repeatedly, and then there was several times in the nineties. And then it's kind of died with Mel Gibson killing his own career and being saying some you know um, ridiculous things and killing his own career. That was the that was the end of it, as far as they were concerned. The studio was like, "It's dead." George was like, "It's dead." There was no more Mad Max, but Mad Max was to rise again, and 
we will talk about, I know I want to talk about, do we consider Fury Road a continuation, a reboot, a reimagining? What is it? Next week, in the next episode, because we will be talking about Mad Max Fury Road on the next episode. Ready for Furiosa. So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, any, any last thoughts though, just before we go? Oh, thank you, Scott. Now, uh, now I, this has been a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad we've done this. This is the true post-apocalypse. This is the where to start, and then we'll go from here. This is the, the real Mac Daddy of it all. Um, but yeah, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Let us know what you think. Do you think this is an underrated gem, or do you think this is a piece of crap and should it was right to kill the franchise? I'm interested to see what people think. Go back and watch it. See what you think. Um, and are you excited for Fury Road and Furiosa? Obviously, contact us at Pod Time Space on Twitter um, or through join the Patreon. Leave a review actually on any of your plat- uh, podcast catcher platforms and check out the Patreon. We've got so much other stuff on there. Trekking through the Twilight Zone, where we are getting through to season five, and also supplementary material for other films that we have done on the main feed. We've done short films, we've done side calls, we've done reboots, we've done all kinds of different pieces. Go and check those out. Some fantastic stuff on there. And we will be doing more of that as we get into Season 5 and our post-apocalyptic cycle, as it will. Uh, But for now, Julian, thank you very much. It's been excellent. My pleasure. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode. streams.